so basically, uh, first of all, just going back in time, I studied in mechanical engineering. Uh, so I was doing uh, automated machinery, robotic cells. So I was doing like projects like this in the manufacturing sector mainly. Uh, so this is the kind of project. I was working in a small company. Um, small enough so I could be the one doing almost all of this. Uh, it would take me <laughs> weeks to do that. Uh, but I would like do the design, send the parts to be machined. Uh, by that time, I would weld myself the frame, send it to paint. I receive the parts, I assemble. I do the mechanical assembly, pneumatics, hydraulics, electrics, programming of the machine, programming of the robots, sometimes implementing vision on the robots. So I was doing like the whole project myself. It's nice because you learn a lot. It's bad because every machine, you kind of anchor it to your ankle. <laughs> So when you need support and all that, the more you have, the more you have to support. So I did that for, uh, I would say, six to seven years. Uh, and then I went to Camso. Does uh, anybody know uh, Camso or Camoplast? It was, yes, OK. What do you know about that company? Um, well, they manufacture like, the rubber tires and tracks. I, I worked there for one summer. OK, good. Uh, so you were working on the engineering side or on the, uh, because that, there's two buildings. So that's yeah, Okay, okay, good. Um, so I worked at Camso for uh, eight years. Um, so from uh, 2008 to uh, 2016, early in 2016. Uh, so I first came into Camso. Uh, we had a central engineering team that was providing tooling and equipment for all the different plants in North America at first. So I was uh, providing equipment, and then uh, most of the plants were saying that they were lacking support from central engineering on these tooling and equipment. So I started a branch that was more like supporting the plants in their project, improvement projects. Um, down the road, I had to make a choice, which was do I continue doing equipment? Uh, one of the things I figured out by doing equipment is even if you do the best equipment in the world, if it's not well integrated in the, the environment of the whole plant, it's, it's useless or almost. So I was sometimes frustrated by the, what I was being asked by the, the client, either internal clients or external clients when I was in the other job before. Um, so I decided to, to kind of uh, open my eyes to what was happening before and after the machine I was doing. Uh, so I, I lean towards uh, more lean manufacturing. So I went uh, uh, doing some training uh, in, uh, in the United States with really like lean gurus and stuff like that. So that's what's nice uh, working for Camso. They have like, money for training and such training. Uh, so I did that. So I kind of, uh, instead of going forward, uh, more mechanical or automation, I just went uh, for uh, industrial engineering, lean manufacturing and all that. So I did some training, training class uh, with really good guys. Then I was traveling all over the world. So I was 50 to 60% of the time I was not home. I was traveling, as you can see, everywhere. So Europe, Asia, whatever. Um, I was providing support to the plant. I was doing some uh, auditing when we were doing acquisition projects. I was going there to uh, look at what are the current capability of the companies we were going to acquire. And then if we are to buy them, where in which plant should we put these operations? What would be the impact inside that plant? Do we have enough space to do it? Or do we need to move the complete plant to another location, a bigger location? Things like that. I was introducing new technology and plants that were probably in Asia uh, 25, 30, 40 years um, late in terms of technology. I was doing assessment of engineering teams over there in Asia that were doing uh, tooling and equipment for the plants we had uh, in Asia. Um, so I was working there. I spent uh, some summer uh, in uh, Sri Lanka um, working with the engineering team there. It was not enough challenge, so I said to myself, why not start an MBA part-time? So I did that while uh, traveling and having uh, supporting teams all over. So sometimes I was attending class during night in Asia because the, <laughs> the class was here. So it was like at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. 
And, um, and so I was having, uh, with the classmates, they were like turning their computer so I can attend the class. Sometimes I was just skipping as well. Um, so I did that. During that time, I was uh, given the opportunity to replace a guy that was sent out uh, in Asia for a project for six months. So I was in charge of all the testing, so you might have seen that. Was in the back with all the different equipment. So there's a team in Magog of about 30 people that are working uh, for testing product. So basically their job is to destroy product every day, all day. Uh, so I was managing that team. Um, at first I was supposed to be there just in the meantime, the guy was going to do his project. Uh, finally, you know, when you take the interim like that, you have two choices. Either you just leave good enough alone and you just support the team and help in managing the team. But with the background I had from efficiency and all that, uh, operational excellence I was doing in the plants, supporting all the plants, uh, I, I really fast went into, uh, I think there's something else we can do with that department and we can bring it to the next level. So after three months, I made several change to the way they were managing their operations, uh, which has led to these kind of results. So I arrived there in 2012. So they were doing like 150-ish tests per year. Um, so when I started, we started to review the, the process, how they were doing things, uh, prioritizing. Uh, I made a lot of emphasis on lead time. I was, you know, nailing that down to the team every morning. The budget for the department stayed the same or almost. The small spike we have at the end, it was to one extent we were too efficient for our internal clients. So we were supplying re test reports too fast. The engineering team on the other side that was developing the product were like, okay, Alex, ask your team to work for another guy because I'm having a hard time following the pace you guys have now. Once, when I uh, arrived at that department, the first thing I did, I was shielding my team from all the engineering team and all the people asking for dates. And I was really bad with the, the guys at that time. I was like, the only thing I'm sure of when I give you a date, it's, it's wrong. I will either miss it or I could be uh, prior to the date. But if, if I, I meet the date 100% of the time, the lead time will be too long for you. So we'll probably, because I will pad myself with some uh, buffer, and then I'll be sure to meet the date. So the date will be too long. So we'll be discussing about the date, and then we stretch it up to the point that I miss it sometimes, and it's like that. So I said, let me work with the team on the process and how we manage the department, and I can guarantee that the date won't be an issue anymore. So they said, and I had some proof record from helping the, the, the plan, so they were confident uh, on that. Uh, so what arrived, uh, what, what uh, happened at the end is that we had, <laughs> I hired some engineer to pre-process the results so we can improve. So that's why there's a small spike in the budget uh, because I had to hire people and we were offering uh, different tests. So we bought like x-ray scanners to scan the parts because we, uh, we noticed that some parts are not even good from the beginning. So there was mistakes in the manufacturing process. For example, so we are testing parts that are, you know, failing uh, from the beginning. So the cost per test just dropped. The problem, it was a bar open for testing. So the guy, instead of testing two or three tracks and be ready to ship it, uh, you know, in the field uh, to the clients, he was asking us to do like 10 tests to be statistically more uh, confident with the results. So the budget was not going down, even though the cost per test was going down because uh, we were doing tests uh, more rapidly. So even with all these results, I was finishing my MBA. I was up to a point where, you know, when you do improvement, uh, when you take like a department like that or a plant and you do improvement, the curve is like this. So up to a certain point, it flattens because it, it's getting harder and harder to improve or have big improvements. So, and I'm not the kind of people that will be in the run mode of the, of the, the, the system. I'm more, uh, I need challenge. Um, so, uh, 
a lot of people, I was doing my MBA, and uh, when you do your MBA, you, you meet with a lot of uh, professionals that are like plant managers and other business and all that, and they were challenging me on uh, seeing these results because I was presenting a lot of things we were doing in the department as project within the MBA in the different classes. And when they were seeing the results, they said, why are you not doing this for other people than staying there? Plus, you finish your MBA, probably you can get something, uh, something different. And at Camso, I was asking to do something else as well, and there was not much opportunity at that time. So, what happened? <laughs> I quit. Uh, so, I quit on uh, January, end of January. And then I, uh, I said to myself, uh, why not uh, start something up? I was hesitating between taking a business and, you know, just taking back a business that was uh, either uh, some, somebody that wants to retire or something like that, so just take over the business and, and continue, or the other choice was starting something from scratch. So that's what we were talking uh, over the dinner. Uh, still today, I'm not sure about the choice I made, but I fully uh, assumed uh, what I did. Uh, because you will see uh, funding is uh, sometimes an issue and I think that I, with the experience I have, I could have taken a manufacturing plan, flip it, and generate enough revenue out of it to fund the project I'm doing right now. And that's probably what will happen because right now we're up to a point where I could you know, buy a manufacturing company and pass it through the machine that is Agiline with the software and the consulting and everything we have built so far. And for sure, we can flip this business to, uh, to success or profit. Um, so startup seems easy, right? What exactly is a startup? How would you qualify a startup? Are you familiar with that term for first? Yeah, we hear it a lot. It's, uh, it looks fun to start something, right? So what is a startup for you? You have a definition. Uh, how would you qualify that? Yeah. I think it probably starts off with a, a basic idea that hasn't been done before, and you want to start up and try to see how far you can bring it. And okay. The business. Okay. Yeah, that's the really early stage of the. Of the any other idea? Plan, plan, read that definition. <laughs> Just read it. Should I read it? Yeah. Plan, yeah. Oh, yeah? An IT startup is an enterprise working to solve a problem where the solution is not obvious and success is not guaranteed. Sounds good. Let's see. So a few words. We have an idea. If you put our work, we launch it, it should grow. Easy enough. Some people are saying that there's a path. You start from your idea, you just go through and success is there. You raise a one million investment at the end. You've got sales on the road, you launch your product, you do all your stuff, you find the team members to help you out. Uh, life's good, life seems easy that way. Then I'm gonna <laughs> do a testimonials about what it is. So basically, one of my job is CEO, and we were discussing that because I'm reading a, a book right now that says, uh, I think I will change that, uh, <laughs> that acronym, because CEO doesn't mean anything, right? It's Chief Executing Officer. If you go to all the C-level, so you work with probably CFOs that were Chief Financial Officers, uh, you have COO, so all the C-level executives eventually, looking at the letters, you know what they do. F is for finance, E, O, o for operation, uh, you have IT, uh, stuff like that. But E, executive, <laughs> doesn't mean anything. So what is suggested, it should be CVO, like Chief Vision Officer. So you are in charge of the vision of the business. Make sure it doesn't fall off the rails and uh, you inspire your people and uh, you move on. So that's one of the hat I have, is being the CEO of the company. One thing you learn uh, in the... Uh, probably in your, your classes, business classes, they always talk about vision, mission, and values, right? Yeah. You heard that? Um, one of the things missing sometimes is the why aspect. Are you familiar with this? Do you know uh, Simon Sinek? Have you heard about this guy? If you haven't, uh, I suggest you look at uh, what he's doing. 
Uh, it's uh, really, really interesting stuff uh, for management and uh, um, concept and all that. And they start with why, that's the, that's the book, but he became famous with that golden circle, they call that. So, company that inspire people are company that have this kind of way of saying what they do, how they do it, and why they do it. So, and it should come from the inside out. Most of the company, we have the how we do it, and we have the what. What are the product, the results, whatever. But sometimes we never see the why. And when you look at apples and these guys, the why is really obvious, you know, like the think different and these kind of uh, words they put, it's really inspiring and it's the, it's, it's the why. So that's something I had to, uh, to think about and we came up with, uh, with something uh, that if you want, it's on our, uh, on our website. So if you go on our website, there's no mission, no vision. There's just the golden circle with the why, the how. I just wanted to, uh, put you the, uh, the meanings of it, so I encourage you to, uh, to look at it. But for your people and your clients, it's a little bit more inspiring than just a mission and a vision statement, uh, regular uh, stuff. So um, we're doing things a little bit differently. Then uh, we have to define the enterprise value. I'm just going to stop here. Why are we uh, defining enterprise, uh, enterprise value? Because I'm a startup, we are just 10 employees at the moment. I still have all this. I come from a background working for a large company, so I was able to see things you should do and should not do that at scale will create problem. So that's the nice part of it. So I, for a startup founder, I'm a little bit different from many others that I meet that just went through uh, university and they started something without having seen much things. Uh, so it's a pro, there are pros and cons in that. Um, but why do we define enterprise value? What's the essence of it? Um, organizational culture is going to def be defined from the values. So okay. once you build up, you probably want both to be defined. Okay. Anything else? Some of the values will help guide the company. When you did your interview at Camso, did they ask you questions about the value or not? Well, I think they asked about like, my uh, personal values. Okay. Because one of the things we were doing was in every interview, and I still do, uh, and still do that for my company, uh, we have the different value. And I was a little bit, uh, you know, I'm a freak a little bit sometimes. These words, they are the same in English and in French. And then the first letter forms the, the word force. Um, the value, basically, it's how we work together, how we do things. So no matter what we do, this is how we will work as a team. And if one of our value is, let's say, respect, and respect is not important for you, we will always be in conflict. That's for sure. So values are profound inside you. And you know, if you don't know how to draw mechanical drawings or program a robot or something like that, I send you to training, you learn how to do it, you come back, you know how to do it. And then with experience, you'll just get better. If you think respect is not a thing, it's gonna be really, really hard for us to work together if for me it is really important. So one of the tests we do, and I, we were doing that at Camp So, and we do, I do that even with my employee. I even do that for intern. I think yeah, you got that question, right? Um, what is, which value is the plus, which one is the, the least, and why? So there's no good answer to that question, right? It seems like a trap almost, but the goal is really for me to understand who you are, how you think, and if these are the five we have, for sure they are important for us. But I want you to tell me which one you like the least, or whatever how you kind of want to say it, and why. Because sometimes you might have a good reason, good wording, or, or uh, good arguments. So that's one thing. Uh, really important uh, for me. So if the fit is not there, there's no way you will work with our uh, with our company. Yeah. You mentioned the core values for the for your business. 
normally from outside, we can't touch it. We can't, we can't, we can't tell you what we think about it. These are your beliefs, your yeah. own beliefs. Yeah. They're not discussable. Yeah. You should not be, well, I like this, I'm not, I, I mean, not like that. What, who am I to judge that? Yeah, but the, the thing with that question is really the, the argument that the, the person will give you to say which one he likes best. So it's basically the preference, if, it, if he would have to rank it, okay. which one is, resonates the most to him and, and him or her, and which one resonates the less and why. So for me, it's, not, it's really on the arguments more than the one they point. Okay. Because they are all important, uh, or if not, they wouldn't be there. So it's really how we do it. Another question I put when I do interview is, why should I not hire you? So actually, we get the reverse question. And everybody is prepared for <laughs> the other side of the question. And the reason behind this one is really to, are you transparent enough or honest enough to tell me what is your weakness and how, because I want to know, do you know it first? Do you know yourself? That's the first thing. And are you transparent enough to share it? And what are you doing to improve on it? And based on that, it's going to go on or go. So these are the two core questions. Because other than that, can you speak English? I just need to talk a little bit with you. It's fine. Uh, so your competence, if, you, if, it's a, if it's an issue, training can fix it. If it's just because you don't know something, a tool or whatever, it's easy to fix. This, not fixable. That's why we say we hire people for their, uh, for their expertise, competence, and all that, and we fire them because they don't fit in the culture or they, they cannot work with the team or the fit is not good all the time. So the other job is VP of Finance. And I put VP, it's just uh, not because I want to have all the title. If you look at my business card, uh, they are not there. But uh, just to tell you that when you start your business, you have to know all this. You have to be somehow good at all this because these are all issues you cannot rely on anybody else. So VP of Finance and Funding. So again, there seems to be a map on how it should work, how funding works. So you start your alone, you have your idea, that's fine. You find a co-founder, so you have to share your business with the co-founder. Then you need some more cash because you run out of the cash you, you get to have. We call, uh, you know, family and friends, so uh, what they call love money. You might have heard that uh, expression. So you dilute yourself again. Then you need seed round. So this is like getting more money. Uh, we're getting closer to uh, commercialize our product. Then you have Series A. Now you get to the venture cap and people that uh, they don't want to work in your uh, company. They just want to put money in and they want you to work and generate profit out of it, mainly. Unless you do like uh, recently, I don't know if you've seen uh, all these uh, IPOs from uh, Slack at 24 billion. And, uh, um, Lyft, 21 billions as well, all crazy numbers, and these guys lose 900 million a year. So the model of the business is raising money, not making money. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, but there's so much money in the system, and uh, but not here in Canada. <laughs> so bad news for you. Uh, it's a lot tougher here in Canada, and uh, I, I read a study last week uh, explaining why Canadian companies are having a hard time versus uh, United States uh, ones. And there is three main reasons. Uh, the first one is we wait too much before getting cash. When we get cash, we get less cash. And we wait too much between round of cash. So we're always like behind. For every dollar a Canadian company spend in sales, marketing, generating sales, a US company have six and a quarter dollars invested. So when you wanna try to cross the border, it's like, it's really hard. A company like mine, probably going across the border, 
would get like two, three millions to try. Try to do your idea. If it works, fine. We'll just put money back in the, the company and you will we'll, uh, we'll raise. If not, it's a fail. We lose three millions, but we want to know it as soon as possible. So we don't put any more money in. Here in Sherbrooke, getting a million, it's going to take 18 months. And there will be probably between five and 10 people involved. Parties putting some money in to get to a million. I did, I was uh, one of the 10 startups that was selected for growth accelerator in Toronto. I was just speaking with one of the coach there. After half an hour, he said, because I said, ah, we're looking into maybe raising uh, 300K or something like that. And it was like, why? Why would you do that? Why not a million? Because you say, getting a million, I just made, made two, three phone calls and we get it tomorrow. What if? So just leaving Sherbrooke to go to Montreal, going to Toronto, going to going south, it's a completely different world in terms of funding. When you get VC back funding, what they are expecting you is the hockey stick. I've heard about that. So they are help, they, they are putting money in, and they hope that it's gonna crank like that. Like a hockey stick. The one that fails, they just go like this, and we call that valley of death. So they are trying, trying. So you put money, it seems to work. So you put a lot of commercialization efforts, and you start selling, and then you <laughs> reality kicks back. You just go down. Then the VC are like, okay, we want to protect our investment, so we put some money back in. So there's a small bump, another small bump, and in the end, we realize that will never happen. Another way is what they call momentum scaling, is that it's wave like this. So uh, this is more what we are doing. So I'm 100% owner of the company as of today. Uh, it's slower growth, but I'm not spending like 20 to 30% of my time reporting what I do with the money. Plus, I'm not influenced by these guys to get short-term results versus long-term results. Uh, with, for, for me, it was important because we just raised like 200K two years ago. And the amount of reporting I have to do just for that 200K as soon as I get enough cash, I give money back to all the people, the two parties that put money in our business, just to get rid of the, and be able to focus on developing the business versus reporting what's happening. So momentum scaling is like, first you build credibility. So you, you do a reference project. So this is like your beta testing with the, the few clients and all that. You get reference. Um, and then you build ca uh, capability, so you start to have more clients, and you develop, and you, 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 you advance your product. And then you get to a point where you build cash flow. And cash flow is sometimes, uh, some things you don't, when you work for somebody else, it's never your issue, right? Because you have your paycheck every week or every two weeks, life's good. But when <laughs> you get to the point where you have to sign the check, you have to find the money all the time. So cash flow is really, really, it's like the blood of the company. It's, uh, you really have to look at it all the time. So that's momentum scaling. So it's just another, another way. So bootstrapping, they call that bootstrapping. So we generate sales from our, for ourselves directly. And I, uh, at Agilene, we have two business units. So we develop the software for the manufacturing sector, but we also have another uh, business unit that is doing consulting. And the consulting is funding the company by ourselves to invest all of it in the development of the, the software uh, in order to get to a point. So it's been three years that we do it that way. Uh, so we had like few investments, but uh, uh, when you have like developers that run at uh, 75K per year uh, in salary, you have two, three of them, uh, 200K is a uh, fast gun plus uh, commercialization and all the, the other efforts. So, um, but that's the strategy we took. 
Um, but for a tech company, it's if I would only be doing the tech part of the business, I, I would be dead already since uh, for uh, two years already. Um, so a tech company, it's for a SaaS business also, it's kind of hard because we build like monthly revenue and we add them up. But you have a lot of investment in the technology and the software and all that before being able to ramp up this revenue. So you have to front a lot of cash before getting the, the, the cash back. So without, you know, uh, without funding or big funding, it's quite impressive what we were able to do uh, in the last uh, three years. But that's a choice from Alex, the VP of Finance and Funding. Now you have to be VP of Human Resources because you need to build a team, you need to hire people, so you need to recruit, evaluate, manage the people, motivate them. You don't want them to quit because when you only have uh, four people on the team and you leave one, there's one that leaves, you lose 25% of your uh, manpower. It hurts a lot. So you want to get people motivated and, uh, uh, and train them and uh, whatever. So you have to really manage the whole thing and make sure that people stay on board. Um, sometimes when you don't have too much money, uh, sometimes you make some choice and you can regret it afterwards. Uh, so selecting the people is really a core thing, especially in the beginning. You want to make sure you have the right people on board. Uh, so make sure you think about it if you have uh, any idea. The other hat is VP of engineering. So we have to develop that software. So. The developer at the office are the one programming and writing code all day, but they have no clue what we're doing. I mean, the science that we put in the software, it's my experience and the, the other consultant, we put our experience back in the software, but the programmer itself, he just programmed the features that we want based on the science we're trying to embed in the software. So I have to be with the team, and myself, I do consulting, I would say, half but I would say uh, two to three days per week. So the rest of the week on Friday, uh, we have meeting, Friday or Monday, we have meeting about the marketing. I have, market, uh, I have meeting with the programming team. So we wrap up the week, plan for the next week. I do daily meeting in the car most of the time with the, uh, the, de the development team every morning. Uh, but I really chose to have people on board that are uh, people that can work by work alone by themselves. Um, I don't need to be there all the time. Uh, so that was a choice again uh, for me to free up time to be here <laughs> and also to, uh, to be able to do some uh, consulting and all that in order to, uh, to bring some cash back. So VP of engineering, you have to develop your product, uh, manage every, uh, every aspect of it or almost. Then you have VP of Marketing, so I'm working with Gerardo that is with me tonight. So uh, Gerardo did an internship last June, a two, year ago. Two, yeah, a year ago. And uh, he worked with us part-time. He's from Bishop, actually, so he um, graduated in uh, April. And uh, now he works with us uh, full-time since then. So I'm working with, uh, with him. We have another guy that is doing marketing with us part-time. So we were having lunch with him uh, today. So we have to manage what in terms of marketing? <laughs> That's just to show you some areas that we have to take care of. So all the social and just to, uh, you know, the main job of uh, Gerardo today is to take care of all uh, content marketing, I would say. So we maintain channels for Alex, our product. Agiline and my personal branding. We publish on every network every day, uh, on every brand, which is hell of a job uh, for Gerardo. And now we're trying to uh, push a little bit more the, 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 the selling uh, aspect of it. So referral, so we have to work with people so they can refer us some leads uh, with partners and people that would be willing to sell our solutions. PR and events, so we have to be at trade shows, we have to be in the market so people see us, they know who we are. Uh, now we're getting, uh, we're getting to a point where uh, Gerardo is doing a good job on social. Uh, we publish so much that when I go to events now, people say, oh yeah, I saw uh, Agiline somewhere and I know you guys. Just because we're 
publishing a lot, so people see us, so it helps us when we go into events, so we have to explain a little bit less what we do, who we are, and uh, things like that. Uh, online advertising, online marketing, to the website, SEO, make sure we come up first. Uh, when I launched Agiline, uh, there's a, I looked and there was just another company that was called Agiline and it was just a, a group that were uh, getting together to discuss about Agile methodology and Lean and they called it Agiline. Uh, and they are in Germany, so I said, well, let's take that name as a business and um, I started with that and then, what, three, six months in, there's a Agiline that I am, so from India, that is doing a software for the IT industry, so for the support the agile met uh, the agile methodology. So they were ranking, were kind of battling for the first spot in uh, Google search. Uh, so the but I think we're first now. Or, yeah. So we beat the Indians. Um, <laughs> Up to a point that uh, when we get more money, we might buy them. So that would be a good idea. So we have to take care of marketing. We have to take care of ourselves. So when marketing is doing a good job, then the next step is uh, going into sales. So we have to generate leads. So that's his job. I have to take the leads, qualify them as prospect, and convert them to customers so we get sales, new customer, and, and uh, money out of it. In the product, uh, the two segments are really different. Consulting, uh, it's mainly based on reputation, I would say, and the type of mandates you do and how you advertise that you're an expert and how do you establish your expertise. Um, so that's one point, but last week we got to a point where a guy just went on our website, booked a demo so I can speak with him 30 minutes and I, we got a consulting mandate in Toronto next week, uh, in two weeks. So since we're doing a good job on that side, but we could do it more. And then on the software side, the type of software we do, uh, we have to do a demo so people understand what it is, what it, it means, what it can do for them, and stuff like that. So uh, the goal is really to get to a demo and then close the cell and uh, implement the software in their uh, business. So being an entrepreneur is all these hats. <laughs> Uh, so yes, you have to uh, bring some innovation, uh, knowledge, knowledge about what you need to understand what's happening in terms of accounting and finance, funding and all that. Uh, I haven't talked about legal stuff, but you have to take care of that. You need to do contract. When you do consulting, we have a contract with the clients. Uh, non-disclosure agreements, stuff like that. So there's a lot of legal stuff that needs to happen as well. Uh, so you, you need to have some, some basis on, on that. Uh, accounting is another one. So you want to be able to uh, speak with your accountant and make sure that you understand what he's talking about. Um, so in all these areas, you have to learn. And I have an engineering background. So for me, doing marketing and sales, was not that obvious at first. So for the first year and a half, uh, but I was just starting early in uh, 2017, I was listening to podcast or YouTube video about with marketing gurus, uh, content marketing, strategy, sales. I was listening and reading two hours per day, every day for almost a year because I was weaker in that area of the business and I knew that without sales, it's just an engineering <laughs> uh, project. So we need to, to, to make money out of it. So I had to learn all this. So now I can speak a lot about marketing tactics and all that, even though I haven't done you know, uh, studies in that. Um, so you have to learn and, and know a lot. You don't need to be an expert in all of that, but you need to have a minimum to be able to, to speak and understand what the experts are uh, saying and, and doing with you uh, when you use uh, outside resources to help you out. So what I've learned so far, why bootstrapping our startups? I think we discussed it already. Uh, I said, I see a lot of... Um, of people that have started their business. Uh, I was at uh, my office with as, uh, as, 
was that espacing. Maybe do you guys know espacing? No. It's an incubator that is uh, here in, uh, in Sherbrooke. So um, I was having my office there, and I, so there's a lot of startup in the building. So you meet with other CEO and all that, and most of them they had financing between 300k to a million, and um, I was probably maybe there was another guy that was not having financing or funding. Um, and the reality is really when I saw all the reporting and all the, the, the work they had to do just to, and when, uh, you know, the guy that has a million, he must be spending 40% of his time reporting to all the people about what he's doing with the money. And all that time is not allocated to developing the business. So for me, it's kind of a waste to do, that, do it that way. So that's why I try to push as much as I can uh, the time where I will bring out time. At least to have the team in place so I can have that time and I know the business is still uh, moving on. Get the right people on the bus. So basically is to make sure that uh, you have the right people working with you because at the beginning they are all like key players to make it happen. Um, before, at the end of 2018, um, I had like three people doing development in the team. I only kept one. All the other ones were fired, changed for new ones. That was a uh, courageous <laughs> move. Uh, everybody to who I speak about that are telling me that I'm crazy. But we were having issues in the, in the software. We were having performance issue, and each time I was asking for the performance to improve, it was worse. So up to a point. And then, with the new team I have in place now, it's it's a completely uh, different world. And after the fact, I can say that I waited too long before doing it. I was afraid of losing the knowledge, uh, whatever I was afraid of. Uh, I waited too long and it cost us uh, time and probably clients as well. Or opportunity that were not able to be converted based on the fact that we were having. Because I was not 100% confident sometimes to go to larger clients as we were having you know, performance issues with the software. So get the right people on the bus. Have you done about outsourcing software development to? Uh, it was not outsourcing. One of the, in the 200K investment that we had, uh, 120 out of it was from a, a, uh, a company that uh, is doing software development for, do software development for everybody. Uh, you just come with a project and they will help you out. So what they did is they, they gave us like two resources for almost six months. And this was converted as the investment. Okay. So there was no, cash and that's, <laughs> that's a wise move in terms of cash flow. So the guy is paying the developers, and the only thing you do is you convert that to debt in your <laughs> balance sheet. And that's it. So no money out. Um, eventually, I have to give the money back or, uh, or whatever. We'll deal with uh, that later on. But at that time, we were able to go from having just a concept of the, the app and be able to have the, the MVP to go to our first client, first real client. So I did that, and I was able to redo that a few months ago. For another six months, I had two guys from another company, and I did the same thing where these guys were with us in the team. What's different is I have one that still works with us, and the other one was switched from that company to our company. So he's now an employee of Agenine full time. Um, yeah, so this is how, but that's the only work we've done so far with outside uh, con contractor. Uh, we're looking into outsourcing the QA of our software in India. Why in India? It's because we're doing agile development and just so you know, when a client asks us for a new feature in the software, a week after the feature is there for everybody in our app in production. 
So we're really, 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 really fast. There's no other startup or company that I know of that do it as fast. Eventually, they do like two week sprints, and then there's kind of a backlog of uh, of release and all that. Uh, we went that way because we noticed that when we wait too long and we push a lot of features uh, in production, the interface and the, the, the app is changing more and people have a hard time adapting to it versus if we do like really small increment, there's just like a new button for a new feature and it's, it's easier for the people, for the employee to manage the change that are almost uh, you almost don't see it, basically. Um, and that's an interesting point. If you ever build a software, what we have realized so far is that we build an MVP. Does anybody know what is an MVP? It's min minimum viable product. So you know Reid Huffman? He's the founder of uh, LinkedIn. Um, and... <laughs> The description that uh, Reid Hoffman is doing for MVP is if you are not shy of showing your MVP, you went too far. So it should be up to that point. The thing is, you don't want to have something incomplete. You just want to have something that will be able to, uh, to grow as a feature. So each time we are asked a feature or that we want to develop a new feature in the software, we always go the, the, the least features that we can put in this. We put it in the, the ends of the, uh, the, the users, and then we get feedback and we build on it. When we don't do that, we go too far. They say that's not what we want, and we program, and we have to redo it. So one of the indicators we have in the business is the, uh, I call it the first time good. So we want to be as high as possible in terms of first time good. So redoing stuff where we don't have enough time to do it at the first time. So we don't have time to redo it. Uh, so we make sure that uh, we do it once. So by doing MVP all the time, we don't go too far. We bring them a minimum feature and then we will rebuild. And as we develop and we push uh, improvement on that feature every week even if it's not okay one week later or even sometimes we can push uh, new features like this week I think we pushed three times in production so we're developing some new modules and uh, we came up with the MVP of a part of the, the module and then we implemented two days later another portion of the module and we're like this so sometimes it can be two three five times in a week every day Sometimes it's just a week. It depends on the, on the size of the feature that we are uh, implementing. But always do MVP or else you'll put at least 10 times that you will have to crash. And when you're the guy paying, <laughs> you want as, le as least as possible of that time. Partnership, the great illusion. Why I'm saying that is there will be a lot of people approaching you with partnership opportunity. I would say that 90, 95% of the time, you're just losing your time. So even though the word seems <coughs> nice and we should be work together, try to find a win-win, it never happens. That's, the, that's what I learned in the last three years. I spent a lot of time meeting with people, discussing, presenting our app, what it can do, what it can do for you, how you could resell that or integrate that in your portfolio of uh, solutions and systems and all that. How much sales out of it? None. All the sales were made by us. So another lessons learned from these years is when people are talking about partnership, just be cautious and make sure that you weigh in the time you will have to invest versus how it's going to end up at the end and what's going to be in for you in that partnership. But most of the time, it ends up being a client-supplier relationship where I buy your stuff and I put it in or vice versa, more than a partnership. So the, the word is nice, but it almost never happened. Branding is really important. So I was, uh, I was involved uh, when they did the branding from Camoplast to Camoplast Solid Meal and then to Canso. Um, and I was, uh, we were having the opportunity to have one of the, the 
the guy that was that did the, the marketing at Camso was a, a big name, I would say, in terms of marketing in the province of Quebec. So I had the opportunity to see and, and learn from him. So from day one, um, each time I get out of the building, I always wear clothes that have our name on it. If I would be sitting in the room, you would be able to see my brand anyway. So when I get out, I get my coat out, you see it. Um, the branding is everywhere. So if I get my coat out, it's also there. Uh, it's not on my car. That's pretty much the only thing that doesn't have the brand on. But branding is really important because if you want, you know, like the shirt, the, 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 the yellow is always there. Uh, everything we do is dark, so there's the branding is everywhere. And if we, if you look at Ageline branding and Alex branding, uh, even though we have created two brands, because there was confusion amongst our clients or our potential clients, uh, by the fact that eventually uh, consulting firm don't sell software or don't, sometimes they sell software but they don't, they don't do it themselves. So that was one part of the confusion. And when we go on the software side. When you do consulting and you are a software company, it's to implement your software. But we do consulting that has nothing to do with our software. So there was a lot of compromise we did in terms of marketing, communication, and branding. So we came up to the point where we said we need to split. Alex needs to be the software as its own website, as its own branding, but still there's a link in Alex by the arrows and by the, the, the yellow so you know it's powered by a gene. So there's a link in between the two. Uh, anyway, so branding is super important. And most of the startup, they don't do a good job on that. And um, we can see the difference. You know, when we go to show, I was alone or we are two in the show. And when I look at the, the boot we have, even though it was done really uh, cheap, I would say that I didn't invest a lot of money in it. People think we are a good uh, a big company the, the the image we we give them they have the feeling that we are like 50 in the office so it's really uh, really important especially if you uh, try to go with the we are in the b2b uh, business so uh, the business needs to be confident uh, on us so branding is really important it's more important to learn and fail than it is to be to always be right. So you will do a lot of mistakes. I do a lot of mistakes. First of all, because it's the first time I do that. I was always <coughs> working somewhere before. Uh, you cannot know everything, so you will be learning a lot. But when you're wrong, just admit you're wrong, fail, whatever, and then learn from it and, and move on and continue. That would be a big lesson learned. Is that, is that fail and to learn or fail? <laughs> <laughs> learn and fail, it means that, because sometimes, you know, people, they don't want to lose uh, their ego sometimes. So you don't want to admit. You know, when you will meet, if you ever meet a, an entrepreneur that tells you that his business is going bad, I would be really surprised. So I was uh, meeting with uh, every day when I was in the incubator with other startup CEO. And each time you ask somebody, how is the business going? Always well, impossible. So <laughs> if you have to fail, you can not always be right and you are doing mistakes. So you just need to admit it, fail, learn from it and just move on. So that, that's basically how I see that, that phrase. Uh, all right, that's another one. Entrepreneurship is lonely. Sometimes we hear the, the word lonely at the top. Uh, when you move on to entrepreneurship, all the challenge you have on a daily basis, first of all, I must be working from 8 in the morning to 12 almost every day since three years. Okay? A lot of people don't understand what it is. So your family doesn't understand why you're doing that to yourself. <laughs> your friends that work somewhere, they don't understand what it is. 
So a lot of, your, of the people, your friends, family, and people you were with before being an entrepreneur, they don't understand the reality of being an entrepreneur. So the, you know, sometimes I go to party with friends that I have since uh, college and stuff like that. And when I'm there, I just listen to the problems they have. And I'm like, if I would only have these problems, I would be so happy. And I happen to have friends that are working for the government in different areas. And I'm like, you have absolutely no idea what it's like being me. So, and I learned with time to just don't, don't try to argue or get into the discussion because nobody understands. So, <laughs> it seems sad, <laughs> but uh, you just need to be, you will get some other entrepreneur friends and they better understand what you're living because they live the same thing. So you will get new friends. So the thing is, I just want you to understand that you might lose friends or get farther from friends you had in the past just because there will be a clash between the life you have and the life they had. And I experienced it myself. I'm okay with it. It's just, I told you uh, at the beginning that I would be honest with you and tell you the truth. That's one of the big truth. There is an entrepreneurship. So it's not always fun. But depending on the type of person you are, it can fit or not. You just need to know it. Time, the one I said none of us are ever going to get more of. Uh, <laughs> one of the things Gary is saying is, if you want to start a business and you work somewhere, 8 to 2 in the morning is enough time to create damage. That's really quoting him. It's, if you are into it and you want to test it, you don't have any excuses. You can use time. You can just listen less to Game of Thrones and all these uh, <laughs> series or whatever. If you're serious about it and you want to commit yourself to it to make it success, a success, time, everybody, uh, there's 24 hours in a day. So how do you use that? And I'm not saying you should not sleep. We're just saying make good use of your time if that is what you want to do. And there will be a lot of time to be involved if you want uh, your business to succeed. And you know, at the incubator, I saw a lot of business or people that wanted to start a business and they had like really, um, they were not seeing it the way it is. And after a few months, gone. They're not there anymore. So there's a lot passing by. They came up with an idea. And when they get to know when they are challenged on their business model and what it means to be the entrepreneur and leading the project and all that, you know, when you are the entrepreneur, there's no, you cannot blame anybody else than you. All the decision, you take all the decision. Um, the only thing is if you're not alone like me in your company, I have employees, but I don't have like partners. When you have partners, you can argue with somebody and you can challenge yourself. Me, I always challenge myself with myself. So I'm always right or wrong. Um, but you have to know that uh, so time can be on your side. It depends on what you do about it. And you know, I, I'm I, I'm really an ambitious person. So I want to grow the business and make it big. It's not everybody that wants to do that neither. So sometimes some people they create what they call a lifestyle business. So basically, it's just not having a bus, but I'm alone in my business and that's enough. Or up to 10 people, it's enough trouble for me. I don't want to grow into 50, into 200, or 1,000 employee. 10 is enough. They're all on the day shift. Uh, that's enough trouble for me. Some people, that's what they, they do. They, 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 they bring their business to there. And uh, there's no judgment uh, behind that. If that's what you want to do, that's feasible. But anyhow, there will be efforts to be put if you want it to, uh, to succeed. That's pretty much it, what I had to share with you. Uh, if you have uh, questions, don't hesitate to ask. There you go. Yes? Yeah. Is that probably the main reason why you didn't just start a consulting firm? Because from what I understood, you call sister, consulting firm is what's working right now. It's, yeah. it's what you're selling. Yeah. Okay, you think of just going 
with that side or is the software really the dream? The software is the dream because the service business doesn't scale. Okay. When you do the consulting, you decide how you do it, what you say, what the, the mindset, the philosophy in terms of management that w the consulting in the consulting we need. As soon as I get another consulting in, I was lucky enough to have an old employee from CAMSO that we were doing workshop together all over the world that came to me and said, Alex, I want to work with you. I know we have the same mindset. We learn it the same way. Um, so I'm confident and I know that if I cannot continue a mandate, he can take over and vice versa. I can go and continue where he's at because we have the, we got the same kind of training and the same mindset and all that. We tried to bring a third one on board. It was a disaster. So it's really hard to scale a service business that depends on people. When you go to funding, I got rejected for investment because I had a consulting firm all in one in Agile because it's all there's two branding but it's all one company and just because I was doing service consulting people don't want to invest they are willing to invest in the software but they don't want the money to be anyhow tied to the consulting ad side of the business so I was approached sometimes with uh, because people saw the software and they thought we were just a software company. And when they understood that, it, that we had both, it was a no-go and uh, nobody wants to invest because it doesn't scale. Is that, can you tell us about the software that you have, Alex? Uh, yes. What it does and its value and why you have a market in there? Yeah. Um, so basically the software, we, uh, we are managing uh, the complete plant from A to Z, so from quote to delivery, we manage the whole manufacturing plant. Um, the difference we have is we are embedding all lean best practice inside the software. So to have worked with SAP and large ERP system at CAMSO, all the lean manufacturing initiatives we were doing aside from the system because we were not able to do it in the system. So we were having like sy parallel system and I think you experienced it probably in the finance department even. Um, there are some parallel system for the efficiency and all that. So for me it was not conceivable why it cannot be in the system that we use on a daily basis to run the business. So that's what we did different. Um, I have another presentation that I did this afternoon. But just to go, I, I'm just gonna go really quick. So there are different enterprise uh, software or category. So this is the footprint we have within that environment. So we're not doing everything. We're not an ERP. We don't do any financial uh, uh, so ever any accounting we do cost accounting so you have in real time the cost of all your parts and all the, the the process and all that so you know how much it costs versus the selling point uh, in real time but we don't do accounting uh, that much uh, yeah so I was comparing you know ERP with a Swiss knife so for me it's really a compromise of each <laughs> so, uh, you know a Swiss knife is a bad plier bad uh, screwdriver and all that but it's Compromise to have a toolbox in your pocket. So ERP, I consider it that way. Uh, so these are like screenshots of the ERP system. So it's ugly. You feel like going back to Windows 2000. Um, but it's quite a, good, a big market. I'm just gonna go through. Just uh, that's interesting for you maybe to know. So the implementation outcome 42% is a success ERP system, so it's quite bad. Uh, when they go over budget, it's four times, three to four times over budget. 50% fails, 30% longer than estimated. So these are like bad. Uh, um, talking about the customer journey, I'm just gonna go through because that was not the goal of uh, So we embrace smart industry instead of uh, industry 4.0. So that's our system. So it's really different. It's uh, cars like this that you can move from one step to the other. Uh, you have that's the inventory, 
uh, following up on equipment, following up on people. We have different technologies, so barcoding, uh, IoT, so we can connect equipment to the system to monitor the, uh, the usage of the equipment. We can use our RFID on different platform as well, so uh, computer up to, uh, to the tablet. With all the data, we can create some dashboarding like this. Dashboarding can be as easy as asking, show me my revenue. Here they are, by country, you have a map. Oh, yearly. So these are the kind of tools we have embedded in our software, so it, it's really easy. Uh, it's also voice, so you can just throw the phrase and it's going to plot the graph and gives you the, the information. So Because it's IT entrepreneurship, so I guess you guys uh, have uh, some kind of an interest in entrepreneurship or? Uh, we have a lot of points to just, just try, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. A couple of questions before you start. What, what if you're looking for somebody to partner with you in terms of financing or funding? Say, someone said, I'll, I'll, I'm a stakeholder. I have two million in my uh, bank yeah. account. I would like to get in 50%. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a yes or no? <laughs> I was approached uh, two weeks ago by a company that came to our website and saw uh, our software. And they said, uh, we would like to partner with you. Would you like to go for a, for a lunch? Why not? So it's a company from Quebec. Um, so we met at, in Drummondville, so halfway both sides. So it's a win-win. Um, Fifteen minutes in the discussion, the question was asked, uh, would you be willing to sell your company? So the answer is always, everything has a price. Mm -hmm. But they were not willing <laughs> to pay the price. Um, and you know uh, what's fun is when you, you, when you talk with an entrepreneur, you know, his best year it is the next one coming, right? <laughs> so we're optimists. So the next month is the next one. The, ne the best year is the next year. Um, their goal was to buy our software and use it to go in the, in the government of Quebec and Canada. And the first thing they want to tackle is the health uh, department. That's how we call that. Because, uh, as you know, uh, it's not the most efficient system we have. So, um, as we are expert in efficiency and how the software is made, it's really meant to show the, the lead time and how much time we, we lose, where in the system and all that. So, the way it's, and I was approached, I would say, a year ago from a consulting firm uh, from Brazil. And in Brazil, the difference, uh, actually, everywhere else, Healthcare is private. So it's a business that wants to make money. So efficiency is the thing. So lean healthcare is a science that exists for a long time. So they were doing consulting in hospital in Brazil and they saw our software they said running an hospital is like running a manufacturing plant. We're just working on people we have to manage equipment, we have to manage resources, we have to manage stock, band-aid, uh, whatever. We have a lot of stock to manage, so it's really like running a plant. Here in Quebec, if you ever go to an hospital and say we wanna run it like a plant, you'll be kicked out on the head <laughs> of, the, uh, of the hospital. So, uh, but that company just came to me, but these guys, they were willing just to use our software, but I was like, it's not in Spanish and, uh, or Portuguese, so uh, there's no way it will happen, even though I would like to travel to Brazil <laughs> to sell it. But, uh, so we kind of postponed it because to me it was uh, too far off from what we were doing, so it was going to like, bring us in a, too far from our main objective. But that company from Quebec, uh, we're still having discussion with them. They realized that it will, they won't be able to buy us because uh, the, the company so far is probably not worth that much money if you look at the books. 
because what we did, we invested in developing the software, so we don't have a lot of clients, a lot of revenue, but a lot of expenses and debt. But now we're to the point where, uh, you know, sometimes you have the curve of the business and it will always go, you start to zero, you go like this and then it's supposed to go like this. So right now we're probably like here. So this is collecting debt, <laughs> investing in the software and all that. And now I think three years later, we're probably to that point here where it's going to kick and sales are, are coming in. And that's the main focus we have now is be selling. So the money is going to be here. And I'm up to the point where I invested all this to create and generate that and get the money back. Um, so selling it would be really bad at that point because they won't offer much for it unless they look more at the the upside of this than this but sometimes uh, in the books you just see this so um, that's why it's not not for now not for now all right thank you so much yeah. but i think i'm crazy because uh, <laughs> no 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 but somebody would come with uh, five ten millions and i would probably say no at that time yeah. at this time okay one last question. But that's, that's me. <laughs> when, when you started, did you have a time frame of like, oh, in three years, I think it's going to be the time for to develop and start selling? Or did you just see it as, as you went on? Uh, I am ambitious and impatient. So okay. it's really bad. The combination is really bad. Uh, I have to talk to myself all the time. I think I'm getting older, so it's getting better um, I learned on the road but um, I would have the same answer as I said uh, we will be selling next month and then it doesn't come and then there, uh, okay, we need to develop more okay next month is going to be the, the one we just it just goes like this but uh, I would say that uh, our goal our original goal was to have uh, 20 clients by the end of 2018 and now we're far in 2019 and we have like 12. Part of the reason is me, I guess. Uh, what I've learned in the last year, I would say, is that, uh, you know, the MVP stuff, these are like late realization where you should not like polish the thing too much before putting in. Because when we go to clients, when they see our software, they're like, oh shit, why I haven't seen that before. So the, you know, each time we get to a client, the closing rate is 100% now. We just don't get to enough clients. So the product is good, but to me, it was kind of not good enough still. So that's something when you're when you're more like on the engineering side, the product is never good enough. So you're always like push, push, yeah. invest, 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 invest. Where if I would be because there's like two type of entrepreneur, the one that are more like engineering or technical uh, people, and the ones that are more like selling. So they sell uh, dust <laughs> at, uh, or. Uh, they, they just sell everything even though it's not done, it's not feasible or whatever, so it's a different profile. And I know I don't have that profile, but I'm trying to, to move more you know, towards that to say, okay, we can sell it, we should not be shy about what we have. Because when people see it, it's like, wow. It doesn't compare to the system we see. In, uh, so like tomorrow we have a meeting with the BDC, so we are presenting our software. So it's part of their uh, portfolio of solution they can offer to their clients. Um, the meeting is online, so uh, there will be people all across Canada uh, looking at our software to propose it uh, for uh, Canada. Uh, we have a trade show in March where we would be attacking um, large company like coca-cola and uh, boeing and these guys large u.s company we were approached by the, the 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 host of that show 
uh, because they got a mandate from the big companies to find innovative solutions like ours because these guys are tired of the solutions that SAP, Oracle, and these guys can provide. So they said, we know these guys, we know what they can do, we know what they cannot do for us. We're looking for something, you know, disruptive, innovative, and we know it, it will never come from these guys. So we're looking for small company, because I said to these guys, each time we approach these big guys, they said, okay, you're just a small startup, 10 employees, too risky, we pass. But now I think uh, they are, you know, it's been three years, so they are, you know, the market is changing and uh, uh, they are seeing like disruptive innovations that come out of, uh, of uh, Silicon Valley and other like uh, hub, uh, tech hub uh, around the, the, the globe. And they see that they are missing an opportunity by not working with these small companies. And you know, if you start, even if you have a plant that is a thousand employee and a big, large plant, if you just go in one sector, one department, it might be like the clients we have today. Mm -hmm. So if we just cut the, the, the whole plant in small pieces, it's just like having many clients at one spot. And you know, the guy was telling me, are you trying to get into Maple Leaf? Uh, and I was like, that's not our target <laughs> right now. Uh, because he said, these guys are opening a new plant in uh, Indiana and they are looking for a solution like yours and they are uh, going to spend 12 million in the coming year on a system like yours. I was like, shit. <laughs> Even if the boot is $15,000 to be there at that show, we just get one contract like that and not a problem. So now we're getting, and now we're up to a point where the software is mature enough we know and the feature set is uh, suitable for these guys. So now we're, we're testing, we will be testing that uh, the, the large enterprise market uh, to see what it can uh, look like. So that would be really different uh, from what we do now. But we have to test it. Thank you so much, Alexander.